It is time for Afternoon Edition's political party. There is no earnest debate or policy wonk discussion for the next hour. Instead, we are celebrating the election campaign with poetry, with comedy, and moments like this. I'm only human after all. I'm only human after all. Don't put your blame on me. Don't put the blame on me. We want to lead the world in preventing tourism, well, it's good politics, because it sounds great, but it's rubbish policy. There's an awful lot more, I'd like to say, but there's somebody pulling at my trouser leg at the moment. <laughs> you smell my, smell my spaniel, maybe. maybe. All right, how are you? Good to see you. I'm only human, after all. I'm only human, after all. Don't put the blame on me. Got a question back, and then... Sorry, is that... You've got a pen in your hand. Are you a journalist? Um, well... I, I've, I've said Costa Coffee uh, from memory, but uh, let me not say that definitively. I'm only human after all. I'm only human after all. Don't put the blame on me. Don't put the blame on me. The plea of so many politicians, but unfortunately, Rag and Bowman with his exquisite lyrics. On June the 8th, people may well put the blame on you, regardless of your political colour, if you haven't represented. Well, we do have, as Sarah said, Afternoon Edition's political party. With us are Jeff Norcott, who's been described as one of the very few openly conservative comedians in Britain. We also have the Labour-supporting stand-up, Gronya Maguire, and the FT journalist and former Liberal Democrat advisor, Miranda Green. Good afternoon to afternoon. all of you. Hello. 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 And Jeff, can I say, if I could be with you now in the room, I would give you a hug. Not because I have any political <laughs> affiliations. Not feel like that it's, it's just so hard to find openly conservative comedians. I'm a political unicorn, mate. Oh, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like bumping into another uh, Eskimo in the desert. That's what it's like. It's fantastic that you are here. Fantastic you. that you're here. Because, of course, at the BBC, we're often accused. Okay, oh, look, we've got another lefty comedian on you, have look at it. It's all lefties, all liberal conspiracy. So it's nice that you're here, Jeff. No, I'm glad to be here, mate. Good for you. Good for you. Right, OK, we need to move straight on, and we're going to kick off with this. Theresa and Philip May gave their first joint interview on, of all places, the one show so for this week. Now, Mr May said it was love at first sight when the pair met at Oxford University, and we learnt that while she has a soft spot for shoes, something we may have known already, he likes jackets and ties, and her red boxes are not allowed in the bedroom, revealing stuff. Also this on their domestic roles. Well, there's, there's give and take in every marriage, isn't there? Of course. There? Yeah. I, I get to decide when I take the bins out, not if I take <laughs> the bins out. <laughs> but, I mean, of there's course... boy jobs and girl jobs, you see. There's boy oh, jobs really? and girl yeah, jobs. Who, who, yeah, what, what boy, boy and girl jobs? I, I definitely do the, the taking the bins out. I do the traditional boy jobs, by and large. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're the kind of man who expects his, to be, his tea to be on the table at 6 o'clock every evening, mm -hmm. you could be a little bit disappointed. No. <laughs> Go on, you, what did you make of it? Well, I just always feel so sorry for politicians when election season comes around. They have to try and pretend to be completely normal and completely like everybody else. Like, to get to the level that they're at, they must be absolute weirdos. Like, complete freaks. But then they have to pretend that they just sit around talking about cookery books. So I, f I felt very sorry for both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Miranda, what about you? I was really fascinated, actually, particularly in the, th in the uh, Who Puts Out the Bins conversation, which dominated the conversation in my office the next morning till about lunchtime, because it's such an insight into people's relationships, you know, and you, these negotiations. Genuinely, I thought it was a clever question about how would you negotiate against someone as tough as Theresa May um, over the home, home chores. So I thought it was, uh, I thought they came across, yeah. across charmingly, actually, and even her slight awkwardness was quite endearing. So it was a win on PR terms, I would say. So, Jeff, in terms of it being perhaps hashtagged as uh, Project Humanise, mm -hmm. uh, did it result in you thinking of our Prime Minister as just being someone warmer than perhaps you well, may have thought of before? First, I've just got to give props to Philip May's bin game. I mean, I I'm still, <laughs> in, that bin game. I'm bin still game. in that post-Easter bit where I don't really know what's supposed to be going out when, so... <laughs> and she, she, she just yes. runs, a, she runs a tight ship. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, in a way, it sent out a good message. I know that sort of for a liberal reaction in terms of saying that their agenda-associated jobs might not play out well in the sort of media world. But I think for a lot of people, 
uh, that resonates and you can go into a relationship with sort of progressive views on gender but you know the first time I did a load of washing and my wife saw her favourite cardigan in that sort of pinky grey oh. colour oh. things can change very quickly oh. yeah, right on up. a localised but level putting yeah. out the bins is my sole role in, in the <laughs> home really I mean that is if I don't put out the bins then wow you so I've so just realised, does it, does it seem like I said that, that women should do the washing there? That wasn't my point, and I feel like a politician <laughs> who's immediately put his foot in it. Well, you just abetted like... then, didn't you? <laughs> I'm more about men's incompetence, to be honest. Strategic incompetence, I think that's called, because well, then you never get asked to brother. do it again. Uh... <laughs> well, I'll tell you who else it joined in the big game. That was Angela Rayner from Labour, and she spoke to Nikki on Five Live Breakfast yesterday about who takes the bins out in her house. Whoever's available at the time, me or my kids or my husband, but it's about, most of the time, it's about which colour bin should we be taking out today, to be honest, in our house. Yeah. But I was thinking about that myself and I thought, can you imagine if Jeremy Corbyn had gone on that sofa and said, oh, my wife, I, she does the cooking and <laughs> I think you'd have got slated for it. You won't get away with that in my house, you know, there's no sort of women's jobs and men's job. It's wh whoever's there at the time. If you see it, if there's a spillage, you pick it, you, you, know, you clean it up and if there's a bin that needs sorting, you deal with it. Well, we also look forward to Tim Farrell and Jeremy Corbyn appearing. Will they bring their partners? What's your, what's your thoughts on that, Grania? Well, I just think it's got. To, it shows just how bored people are with elections that we're <laughs> discussing bins. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is literally the it's bottom an issue of that the barrel. Everybody. We're <laughs> <laughs> just like I don't know. What do you, what do you think of bins? Um, I think I feel I feel really, really sorry for um, sort of party leaders' wives that they sort of have to trot out to kind of go look. They're normal, I swear. So um, <laughs> I think maybe they should just invite all their friends as well. Just go hard or go home. Have their whole, you know, their entourage. Their, I think Jeremy Corbyn should go on with his wolf pack. All the lads <laughs> from the allotment. A few cans would be brilliant. Do, do, Miranda, do they have to be taught politicians to be able to do genuine, sincere small talk? Well, it depends who they are. I mean, some of them are appallingly bad at it. I think we... Gordon Brown you, wasn't yeah, ideal, well, was it? That's yes. exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> right. you know, and there was this terrible... You know, when he was first took over from Tony Blair, they tried to make a massive virtue of it, saying, you know, not Flash, just Gordon, was the sl slightly painful slogan. <laughs> and then it, then it became... <laughs> oh. Do you remember that one? And then it, oh, then it, no, then it became... No, drifted away. Yeah, well, so I'm very sorry, everyone, to remind you about that. Um, and then it became more and more painful as they tried to get him to show his human side, and he had this dreadful kind of rictus grin, because somebody obviously mm. told him to kind of warm up and smile more, so he'd do the serious bit with all the figures, and then he'd give this sort of slightly frightening smile at the end of the sentence so um it's really difficult i think if somebody is is not naturally sort of warm and not naturally an extrovert but i think actually sort of funnily enough with that theresa may interview the fact that she's it doesn't come naturally to her mm. it kind of came across as slightly endearing because he's obviously the more outgoing one well tim, tim farron has got chummy locked down really hasn't he amongst the leaders? he has got chummy locked down but he he has a spouse who does not want anything to do with public life and i mean who can blame her right, oh, right. If, I was so, a, if i was a politician or a prime minister there's absolutely no way i'd let my wife on television and it's only because of experience of social situations is that people always end up liking her a lot more oh, 100 percent. <laughs> i have lost her to so many friends over the years that no Way. I'd probably just get one of my wrong and mates on, to be honest, and let people judge me like that and think that I was good by comparison. I think, I Nick, Clegg, a, I think Nick yeah. Clegg has felt like that over the years, possibly a little bit. Well, I think it's quite a good idea, actually. You should be able to take any, you know, somebody else if your yeah, spice doesn't want to go. Yeah, something in your life that people can judge you by. Why does it always have to be your partner? <laughs> well, let's have a little chat about social media because party hacks and supporters all busy making social media content that they hope is going to go viral. But sometimes it is the gentler memes that entertain us here. Like the Twitter account, Is John Curtis on TV? Uh, the University of Strathclyde professor and veteran commentator was rushed to the nearest TV studio as soon as the election was called, and basically he hasn't moved since then. Here's the ballot box, brain box on Newsnight. I think my reading of what, where we're at is actually, although the Labour Party is down in Scotland, it's not quite out. It still managed to get a fifth of the vote here in the local elections, and to that extent at least, the gap mm. between them and the Conservatives is still sufficiently narrow that actually the battle for who is going to be the principal party of unionism in Scotland has not yet been won and lost.
Well, the Twitter feed is just a series of snaps showing Professor Curtis on air again and again. It's got more than 5,000 followers. And it's, Jeff, strangely charming in its simplicity. Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of good kind of uh, political Twitter accounts and, and parody accounts. There's one, well, there's one also that does uh, Partridge, so they find political moments and they get Alan Partridge quotes and stick them alongside, which is well worth a look. Uh, I also enjoy the Jeremy Corbyn for PM Twitter feed. It's not actually a parody account, but it's just quite funny sometimes. <laughs> um, there was one the other day where they said that he's narrowed his... Uh, He's narrowed the Tory lead to 11% and they were literally <laughs> dancing. And it sort of reminded me of that bit in the Iraq conflict where Comic Kalali had those tanks in the background going, it's absolutely going to be fine. But, um, but yeah, these kind of accounts are a welcome relief. Well, I, didn't, I did find it slightly odd when John McDonnell came out after the local elections and uh, his first line uh, to, to, to shore up the party faithful was, well, it's not as bad as everyone said it was going to be. Well, yeah, I mean, it was almost like he's the kind of guy that the bit between the Titanic striking the iceberg and sinking, he'd say, well, it's still technically a holiday. You know, <laughs> you're not seeing the problems here, John. <laughs> Oh, we've got to let Gronje come back. Come on, Gronje, you can't let Jeff get away with that. Well, come on. I, I think the usual, the funniest, best account slaying it at the moment is Ed Miliband's Twitter. Yes, he's just, yeah. he's just. I wish yeah, he's on fire. we had seen more of that Ed uh, a few years ago. I think he's brilliant. He's my favourite Twitter feed. Well, that's because he hasn't got an army of publicists around him. Exactly. Controlling he what, what he can <laughs> say. He can yeah. say what he he's wants unleashed. now. He's been unleashed. <laughs> Once he got rid of the publicists and the stonemasons, he was fine, <laughs> wasn't he? They were holding him back the whole time. The, stone, the stonemasons were definitely <laughs> holding him back. Miranda, uh, for you. Yeah, so I, I like an account called Corbin Fan, which I have to say I didn't realise was a parody for a long time because it's so... <laughs> So convincing and he's just very very angry all the time about everything particularly the biased mainstream media and I actually didn't realize it's a very very subtle parody account and then there's one that I like which in fact isn't a parody but you'd think is called conservative woman which is a whole website about how we should be back go back to baking and not bother our pretty little heads <laughs> I'm with any of this policy nonsense <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. Social media is obviously playing a much bigger role than, than ever, isn't it? There's lots and lots mm. of people to choose from, isn't there, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in a way also what um, this election has given people experience of is, I, I don't know if it's because of democracy fatigue, but there seems to be a lighter touch to it as well. I think that we're, we're all kind of aware that political arguments these days aren't... There's almost like a game of conquers, aren't they, where everybody sort of goes home, home with their conquer. <laughs> so you just get them out, you have a little fight, and then you'll feel the same way afterwards. So I, I have noticed that, that there's been some rancorous elections of late. There's something about this one that, that feels a bit different, and there's certainly a lighter touch to it. I think that's right, and I think people have also realised that you can't convince anybody on Twitter or Facebook <laughs> by sort of having no. a Barney. You know, you're not really winning anyone over to your side. You're only comforting people in your own sort of echo chamber so you might as well make some jokes at the same time so can you identify i guess swing twitters uh, sweeters i guess <laughs> maybe you could come up with so you could because people seem so deeply entrenched on social media don't they but I think, especially after Brexit, people have oh, realised yeah. there's just no point arguing with anybody on Twitter. <laughs> this is, it does yes. no point whatsoever. Yeah. I actually find I've got really into following like really right wing Americans on Twitter because they're they're just so happy. <laughs> they're so happy. Life is going really well for them, and right. it's like a little holiday. I just go, oh, they weren't happy. It? Surely they weren't happy with Macron. I don't think they know who Macron is. Oh, right, fair <laughs> enough, OK. Right. Is that Macaroni? Macaroni? <laughs> yes. That's, that's okay. some sort of tea time snack, isn't it? Yeah, right, OK, yeah. fair enough. Right. Uh, there's, there's right. Actually, there is a really good American one, which I started following, which is does, does Sylvanian families, you know, those little animal toys. But yeah, which oh, my daughter acting loves. Acting out Trump's White House, that's wonderful. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, I've got to I check that out. I show that to my seven-year-old daughter <laughs> to get her into politics through good Sylvanian plan. families. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is the Marshall Mathers moment of the week. He opens his mouth, but the words won't come out. He's choking how? Everybody's choking now. The clock's run out. Now, if you hadn't heard that uh, Labour's Dino were going to a bit of a muddle in a couple of interviews last week, then Ian Duncan Smith has been out to change that. Now, here's a reminder of MCIDS in a place. <sighs> he was, uh. <laughs> he was. Oh, do you know what? I can't. <laughs> Here is the Shadow Home Secretary first on LBC trying to recall how much the policy of recruiting 10,000 new police officers would cost and she doesn't rhyme a single bit of it. They will cost... They will... It will cost... 
um, about... Oh, the buttocks are clenching. We'll leave that there. Uh, enter the quiet man of hip-hop himself, former Conservative leader and work convention secretary, IDS, who had this to say on ITV's Good Morning Britain. Just in the break there, one of the great iconic cultural moments I've probably ever experienced mm. on this sofa, where Ian Duncan Smith, <laughs> perhaps the last person you'd expect to know this, was talking about a message perhaps for Diane Abbott, which was he began reciting lyrics from Eminem. He was rapping. You were actually rapping. Yeah, no, Would well, you like to rapping. remind us of these words, Mr Duncan Smith? Well, I only said that, because um, you were talking about Eminem earlier yeah. on, and uh, I said that, of course, he had his Lose Yourself lyrics. There's some lyrics for Diane Abbott. Can we, can we have some? Well, he, he start, well, it's halfway down, and he yeah. says, um, he opens his mouth, but the words don't come out. He's choking now, everybody's joking now, and the clock's run out. <laughs> and I thought that was... Uh, that's amazing that he know that. And for anyone who's interested, uh, if you want to hear Philip Hammond doing Kendrick Lamar, I'm sure the <laughs> album will be out at some point uh, later on this summer. So, uh, wow, uh, Jeff, where do you even start with the most unlikely cover of an Eminem song in the history of music? I think it may have been the whitest moment in history. <laughs> it is Morgan and IBS. <laughs> discussing hip-hop. I mean, the thing was, he had an out where, because it obviously happened in the interval, so Piers Morgan says, oh, well, while we were off air, you did something. Oh, God, no, I didn't. What are you talking about? You just, it was a sobering moment where he could have changed. I mean, it's funny, the way you pronounce it, IDS, it does sound, it sort of sounds already like he's the 46th member of the Wu-Tang Clan, doesn't he, <laughs> Re repping for his DWP posse, but, I mean, th there's a lot being said in this election about reaching out to younger voters and engaging with them, and I think, actually, when you see what happens when people try and do that, you think it's, because uh, I used to be a teacher, actually, and this is, I, I can take the mic out of IDS but I actually did more or less what he did I did one of those kind of teacher lessons where I went like guys you ever notice how like rap and poetry are sort of the same <laughs> and they were like yes we have noticed that but we don't really want to hear it from you so um, can I just say that I put Ian Duncan Smith into the Wu-Tang name generator <laughs> okay and it came out as Midnight Madman <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good name. This is the first yeah. and last time that he will ever be called that. Midnight Madman. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear, my seagulls are getting a bit out of hand here. We're trying to tone them down, but there's a, there's a microphone that's picking them up, so I hope they're not annoying you. Grania, we, I, I don't know, which is better for you in terms of buttock-clenching moments, IDS or, or the wonderful uh, nightmare that she had, Diane Abbott, earlier oh, in the week? I just feel so sorry for Diana, but I, I mean... She get. I think she attracts so much abuse that I think is so un. Like obviously, you know, she made a mistake and blah blah blah. But she just attracts so much. I think disproportionate abuse online, and then just ugh. Like Ian Dungas, but he just was so pleased with himself for remembering <laughs> some lyrics to a pop song from ten years ago. Oh, it just. I wanted to vomit forever. <laughs> <laughs> she just. Stay off the fence there. Um, Miranda, there is some suggestion that IDS might have taken inspiration from hearing um, the song Stan, which was one of Ed Sheeran's Desert Island Dish, which went wow. out the day before oh. his interview. Um, some spin doctor thought it would be a good idea, maybe. Was it a good idea? Did it make him down with the kids? <laughs> I mean, I thought it was fairly excruciating, but, you know, they've also, on the other hand, come a long way since those awful days when Peter Lilly used to sing Gilbert and Sullivan songs <laughs> with made-up little ditties about uh, single parents uh, in the bad old days. So, I mean, I would, I, I would, let's put a positive spin on it. It's kind of progress from Gilbert and Sullivan to get to Eminem, you know. At least he wasn't wearing a baseball cap. Oh, yeah. yes, exactly. He <laughs> Maybe he's the mystery cap. act for Glastonbury. Maybe he's going to be appearing on the hip hop stage. Would be outstanding. What, with the kind of that, uh, uh, maybe that bleach blonde wig on? <laughs> yeah. Reese Mogg on beatbox. <laughs> <laughs> Never knowingly left the 19th century, but he came to Glastonbury to rap alongside MC IDS. Uh, all right, well, talking about uh, poetry, uh, Keo Chingonyi, whose first collection is coming out next month, came into the studio earlier. And I saw him reciting poetry uh, this week at the Manchester Literature Festival, and he is just brilliant at what he does. And he just did this poem exclusively for Afternoon Edition. This poem is called Election Season. It responds to a poem by Bassi Ikpi. Welcome to this most public of job interviews. Welcome to working the shoe leather. Welcome to shaking hands with the electorate. Welcome to cooing at indifferent babies. Welcome to pledges, punchy gestures, the potency of a well-placed plosive. 
Welcome to Arguments on the Merits and Limitations of Socialism in the Quiet Carriage, the Nightclub Lose, at the Supermarket Checkout. Welcome to This Has Been a Party Political Broadcast from. Welcome to How Can We Entice the Young Voter. Welcome to Quotas, to Placards and Badges, to Window Displayed Allegiances. Welcome to the Flag. Welcome to I Can't Talk About Politics with Mum and Dad. Welcome to, I don't vote, but, welcome to vote or die. Welcome to, what's in it for us? Welcome to union and dissolution. Welcome to coordinated tactics. Welcome to civic duty. Welcome to the press conference. Welcome to Brexit means Brexit. Welcome to means tested. Welcome to manifestos. Welcome to polls. Welcome to never mind that to fix the potholes in my road. Welcome to hard working people. Welcome to costings and hustings. Welcome to democratic process. Welcome to various means of measuring swing. Welcome to a cheeky flutter on the outcome. Welcome to the chatter of pundits. Welcome to budgets. Welcome to a renewed commitment to social justice. Welcome to golden handshakes. Welcome to a hostile environment. Welcome to more bobbies on the beat. Welcome to up late, everything crossed. Welcome to a cross in a box. Teo Chingoni there, what a beautiful voice, as well as a great poem. Um, you can see a video of that on the Five Live website right now. Teo will be back on the programme to talk about his life and work with us next month. We've had asked each of our panellists, rather unfairly, in the wake of getting a professional poet to do it, uh, to prepare a poem for us. Grania. Uh, well, I was deeply inspired also, so I have written. Uh, it's called The Labour Manifesto. Manifesto is red, MPs are blue, Let's campaign for a landslide, or realistically, another devastating inner party coup. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we of course all, all read that earlier on in the newspapers, Gronje, because uh, that was leaked to all of us uh, earlier on today, that particular poem. Uh, Jeff Norcott, you have a poem for us. And it is very unfair after Kaya Chingoni does poet. It's, it's like saying, oh, this is what Michelangelo did. Now here's a spray can. Uh, see Pretty what much, you can do mate. with it. Yeah, but, Pretty much. But bring um, it on, Jeff. Bring it on. Okay, it's going to be short. Roses are red, violets are blue, and for the sake of BBC balance, I should say other colours are available, even though no one's going to vote for them. <laughs> I'm crying, I'm crying. I know, it's, moving, it's deeply, deeply moving. <laughs> Shall we hear one from our, one of our lovely listeners? Uh, you can, Yeah, because you can send us your own ones. Here is Ralph in Dunstable. There was an MP from Maidenhead <laughs> who became PM with the party she led. Her backbench remainers were posing her dangers, so she called a snap election instead. <laughs> boom, boom. Very good. Nice fun, Ralph. Thank you very much indeed. You're listening to Afternoon Edition. It is Afternoon Edition Political Party. We have Grania with us, we have Jeff with us, and we have Miranda. You're listening to a BBC Five Live podcast. If you like this, you might also like this. Kermode and Mayo's film review. If you don't know your app from your elbow, oh, ha, boom, ha. tish, here all week, tip your waitress. To find out more about our range of podcasts, click, tap or swipe. bbc.co.uk slash five live. You know, there's a, there's a riptide out there. I'm looking at it right now. You wouldn't want to be out there on your surfboard not knowing what you were doing. Anyway, it's Afternoon Edition's Political Party, a Is celebration... Is it going to the right or the left? ...of the campaigning week. I wouldn't know unless I was in it. I don't know just to see it. Okay. Um, with us are Jeff Norcott, N N Norcott. Should we try that again? Out and proud, openly Conservative comedians in Britain, uh, <laughs> Labour st supporting stand-up Grania Maguire and FT journalist and former Liberal Democrat advisor Miranda Green. Now this... Gaff of the week. And if you take it at face value, which we do here at Afternoon Edition, no cynicism on this programme, no sir. The winner is the Labour Party for managing to leak in entirety their own draft manifesto. Unless anyone here thinks that was some kind of cunning ploy. Anyone? Jeff? 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think, I think, well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, there are obviously some policies in it that people are going to like, but um, there are, I mean, for me, as a, you know, renationalisation, really, it's like, it's, it's a bit like your dad going, kids, I'm thinking of getting the band back together. You're like, you know what, dad, it, it's gone. No one likes Skiffle anymore. Just go and sit in the shed, please. Um, <laughs> and there's other stuff like, you know, being very cautious about, about nukes. I think the thing about nukes is we've had them since the 50s and we've never used them. So... We've been fairly cautious up to this point anyway, but um, I, I've got to say, I, I think that it, it will be a slight success for them because they've sort of, they sort of road tested some of the policies and they might get rid of some of the, the slightly more far reached ones. But um, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of spending in there and it, it, it's, it's concerning to somebody, you know, a fiscally prudent person like me. I'm hoping mm. that Nick Clegg, uh, Miranda, will have the mm. temerity to come out and say, wait a minute, tuition fees? Well, I had that idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, the Lib Dems famously promised not to raise them, of course. Oh, and not getting rid of them entirely. Yes, yeah, exactly. getting rid of them entirely is unbelievably expensive and means you've got to not spend money on people lower down the education system where they might need the money more, arguably. So I'm not sure that's mega sensible. But I agree, the sort of the idea of actually leaking your entire manifesto. They may get a couple of days airtime discussing some of the policies in more detail than they would otherwise have got, but I think it wasn't a great look to then get in a huge strop about it and not turn up to the, their own poster launch and all that kind of thing. I think the sort of shambles plus bad tempers not particularly attractive, even Grani, if some of the policies go over, you know. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, Grani, do you think that you know, anything will be tweaked now? Do you think that actually it's taken all the wind out of the sails of the actual policy launch, manifesto launch? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's a, a sort of a clever idea. They get sort of two bangs for their book. They get mm. the leaked for coverage and then when they actually release it properly. But I mean, the manifesto sounds brilliant. Like, I, it's like it's it's my it's my home base. Like, I'm supporting all of it. But my only worry is that it's so ambitious. And I just it feels like Jeremy Corbyn is like a comedian who's got amazing material, but he hasn't figured out how to use the microphone or face in the right direction. And his flies are undone. But if you could just <laughs> listen to his material, it's so good. But he just doesn't help himself with you know, the I was, presentation. I was, I was thinking it was a bit like, do you remember that, that, that clip where Oprah comes out and goes, you got a car, you got a car. Yes. It seems a bit like the sort of political equivalent of like that. You know, know, everybody we gets a car. Cars. No, we it's nice to have cars. Car. We can afford cars. Let's have cars. Yeah, we deserve cars. <laughs> well, Electric there, there cars. Was the, there was the wonderful occasion last year when somebody hacked the Labour Party's Twitter account. Do you remember? And they promised every person in the UK their own owl. And it does... <laughs> It does feel a little bit like that. You know, you can have anything you want without actually working out how you're going to deliver I, it or pay for it. I want them to do... When they finally announce their manifesto, it should be delivered by an owl. Yes, that <laughs> yeah. would be very nice. I was gutted by that, Lake. I built a, built a barn and everything. <laughs> and then too. found out it was a hack. Nightmare. Anyway, a BBC cameraman was taken to hospital this morning after his foot was run over by a car carrying Jeremy Corbyn. Giles Walterton is said to be in good spirits, thank for, for that, and the BBC said they're focusing on making sure he's OK. But the thing that set the internet ablaze is a photo of Jeremy Corbyn and an aide uh, who looks uncannily like Tom Cruise looking out the back of the car after the incident. <laughs> now, uh, you may have seen the spoof Twitter account Corbyn Superfan, which it says politics has sunk to a level where BBC cameramen are now getting themselves run over to distract <laughs> from triumphant <laughs> manifesto launches. Hashtag... General election 2017. Uh, Miranda, I mean, good grief. I mean, first the leak, now this. What, what more could go wrong? It's Unless they get Diane Abbott to read it up. Yeah, it's pretty unfortunate, isn't it? I mean, uh, he's very nice, that cameraman, Giles, by the way. So I do feel sorry for him and his foot. I think, I think. How do you know him? Well, he, you know, he's he's one of the regular cameramen that's always with the Pol BBC politics team around Westminster. So, right. but you know, everybody. He doesn't West, deserve that. The famous that. Westminster Does village he? will stick up for right, Giles. For I will tell you, yeah. He's a good lad. He doesn't deserve that. <laughs> that's right. So I'm not sure about the kind of Tom Cruise sidekick. I think that's a man who. Uh, came David through Schneider. Me me momentum and is is mm. is phenomenally good looking, but uh, <laughs> maybe it's just a really terrible stunt double. You know, if it goes off, this guy just gets in the way of the bullet. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's Corbyn's plan B. You know, they're going to produce he's a jump thriller on a sofa, shouting how much he's excited about the manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's all some really bizarre way to promote the the policy to renationalise the railway. Well, maybe they're going to... Well, it's so dangerous, who knows? Maybe they're going to run with a stopwatch to A&E and time how long it takes uh, this cameraman to get seen to and then use it oh. as part of their manifesto. Oh. Can they redraft it? They redraft it and go to Giles Walterton. Four and a half hours he was in A&E. That would not happen under a Labour government. They could, maybe they're doing that.
I mean, it's, it's a high-risk strategy, I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> but who knows? Well, I'm sure that the Sun will use a Mission Impossible pun about Corbyn at some point. So. <laughs> yes, of course Yeah, that is the photo to use, isn't it? He looks uncannily like Tom Cruise. Now, let's move on. They say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but you won't hear the Conservatives submitting that about their new energy policy. On Tuesday, Theresa May confirmed a Tory government would cap gas and electricity prices for people on standard variable tariffs. It's a move suspiciously similar to the price freeze advocated by Ed Miliband before the 2015 election, which drew this response from David Cameron at the time. There's one thing governments can't control, and that is the international wholesale price of gas. I know we'd like to live in some sort of Marxist universe where you can control all these things, but he needs a basic lesson in economics. Freeze, cap, cap, freeze. Very, very, very different things, as the Conservatives' Greg Clark explained. Labour's was a very crude policy. It was to uh, it was to freeze prices and actually wholesale prices fell. Uh, it was to directly uh, intervene by politicians setting the uh, the tariffs. But here's the exact wording of Ed Miliband's 2015 manifesto promise on energy. And my apologies for those of you, of course, who've memorised this. <laughs> Labour will <laughs> Labour will freeze energy bills until 2017, ensuring that bills can fall but not rise. And we will give the regulator the power to cut bills this winter. There you go. Weirdly enough, that was that's from a, an M M&M and M rap as well. <laughs> <laughs> Labour will freeze until 2017. Oh yeah, it doesn't rhyme very well, but yeah, I get it. Put a freeze cap on your backside. <laughs> <laughs> a freeze cap in your ass. Is yeah, that, I wasn't going to say that. Yeah, well, well, you, you, well, you can do a double S. I've looked at the Ofcom list. It's yeah. not on there. <laughs> OK, well, now, listen, there's a cigarette paper between these two policies, Miranda, isn't there? there? There is, but you see, this is the one of the wonderful, you know, unwritten rules of politics, is it depends who's saying something, whether it's credible or not. And uh, the, the, the thing is that somebody like Theresa May can actually announce relatively left-of-centre policies without damaging her... Uh, the impression she gives to the electorate. Somebody on the left suggesting the same policy will get slated for it. It's unfair, but it's true. And actually some of the most talented political leaders that we've had in the last 20 years of those who've been able to do this kind of cross-dressing, where you pick up ideas from either side of the centre line, if you see what I mean, um, and yeah. they can go over. If, if you're not already seen as weak on an issue, you can suggest something quite controversial. In fact, she herself said something quite interesting yesterday where she admitted it wasn't a naturally conservative market-oriented policy, but she felt it would deliver for people. So she's getting away with it. There is no, no doubt about that. But it might not work, because, of course, if you try and cap something, what hap tends to happen, and this is what happened with university tuition fees as well, is that everyone actually charges the highest level. So consumers might not win out as much as, as they think from it. All right, before this seems like a, a wholesale, uh, let's focus on what uh, Labour are up to. Uh, time for some Lib Demery, and uh, that is actually a word now that I've said it. And uh, Tim, smell my spaniel Farron, <laughs> wow, has been talking to ITV about his early political inspirations. Specifically, he was asked if he had had an I Love Maggie badge in his youth. The answer was no, but... I had pictures of strange sort of left-wing politicians. I remember I had a, a Mrs Thatcher picture. I had a John F. Kennedy picture, I had a Joe Grimmond picture. I was fascinated with uh, people who were, But one you of know, your mates said you were a bit of a young Tory. No, that is not so. Uh, so I had a... Uh, there was a young woman, let's be careful what I say, who, <laughs> when I was about 15, 16, who had a soft-top Morris Minor, uh, and she was a young Tory, and so I was somewhat taken aback by her. So come on, Jeff. Did you grow up with a life-size po poster of Douglas Hurd above your bed when you were growing up? No, no. I mean, I, I you know, I, I uh, as I said, my dad was a trade union man, so I sort, I sort of had to conceal my political identity. You know, I was sort of like a. When did you come out to I was him? Like a political Billy Elliot, really. I had to. Um, I was desperately trying to get his approval. You know, but how, uh, how difficult was it for you to come out? To well, him? you know, he he wasn't pleased, but my mum was a Lib Dem, so she was obviously ups, upset. <laughs> <laughs> Miranda, well done. <laughs> Look at that's a win. <laughs> she was upset. She didn't want to hurt my feelings by telling me she was upset. So it's sort of classic Lib Dem response. I think. <laughs> I think that um, I just think the most troubling thing is it's not who the posters were of. It's just the fact that any teenage boy would have political posters on his wall. I mean, I've got a one-year-old son now, and when he becomes a teenager, I think to be honest, I'd rather find a pound of heroin than a poster of Ronald Reagan because if I find it, I'll stage an intervention quicker then. 
I used to. <laughs> Dad, do you like my Mike Pence poster? Exactly. <laughs> Weird. Um, when I was at secondary school, I had a poster of Tony Blair in my locker. Very good. At secondary school? Yeah. But we all did the back then. He, was, uh, he had a bit of extra from, something. Yeah. Okay, what, but, okay. <laughs> so w where, was this person next to a poster of a band? Or was this just... No. Just <laughs> Tony Blair? Yeah. Did other at least holding know? a guitar, Gronya. At least in his guitar stage at Oxford or Cambridge or wherever he went. Oxford. It was in his new Labour glory. It was his hair was was it was a more innocent time back then. <laughs> That's wonderful, Gronny. You should pop round and have a cup of tea with my mum because you should see the front of her fridge. She's got cut out pictures of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown from oh. the early nineties to now. Cover the entire fridge and freezer. Some of them are getting a bit worn, as you can imagine. She still kept them. Oh, she remains faithful to Mr. Tony. Yeah. Oh. Very much so. Is that what she calls him? No, that's right. No. I thought, yes, it's like a character from Driving Miss Daisy, uh, Mr. Tony. Yeah, that's very strange. Just uh, a quick update from Real. There's been two guys, right, that have left with a blow up dinghy about five minutes ago from where I'm standing, and they're still walking to get to the sea. The tide is that far out. They're just, they're still going. They're still, well done, lads. They're the only people left on this beach because the, the clouds have closed in. Let's talk about dangerous sports uh, for a moment, not like dinghying. Uh, Vladimir Putin has been showing off his ice hockey skills. Six goals and five assists in an exhibition game in Sochi. Uh, he turned out alongside retired NHL stars and Olympic champion and his own defence minister in front of tens of thousands of fans. Uh, so, what dangerous sports would our party <laughs> leaders play? Grania, Jeremy Corbyn. I don't think, I was thinking like something Soviet, like shot pushing or something. <laughs> but then I don't think Seamus Milne would let him. Because <laughs> I think Seamus would do it on his behalf. What about you, Miranda? What can you see Tim Farron getting up to? Um, well, I think Tim Farron's already this week done, done a weird, dangerous sport that he's invented, driving a hovercraft round and round in circles. Um, on, on, a, on a beach but I thought for Corbyn I was trying to think of something that's both kind of retro and also where you fight to the death with your own <laughs> teammates because those are the kind of main <laughs> characteristics at the moment so I think kind of circular archery maybe we could adapt archery if they the thing is though if he was part of Fight Club the first rule of Fight Club none of them would agree to would they because <laughs> <laughs> the, the, they'd they, leak the rules they would be leaking yeah. the rules like continuously <laughs> uh, what about uh, here we go we haven't mentioned uh, Mr Paul Nuttall from UKIP yet uh, Jeff what do you think Sporting wise, well, I was. I mean, I had. I was sort of thinking Theresa May. She could, uh, if, she, if she wanted to do a dangerous sport, she could wear fox furs and go running around a field in Gloucestershire, perhaps, <laughs> just to see how uh, how that one plays mm. out. <laughs> I'm going to vote for them. Don't agree with everything. Uh, <laughs> Paul Nuttall, who's he? He's the one. What's he? He's the he's, he's the UKIP one, isn't he? He's Paul Nuttall. Yeah, he's the UKIP one. Yes, he's yeah, the UKIP one. The one whose party didn't do very. Very well, well, in well the maybe he could elections. headline Brighton Pride or something. Just something really out of uh, go somewhere really out of his depth culturally. Well, according to Paul Nuttall's website, he won an Olympic gold. <laughs> oh <laughs> yes, no, I saw that. I saw that picture of him narrowly beating Usain Bolt uh, in Rio last year. Yeah, and no, I saw that. It was an extraordinary achievement from him. I'm surprised he's gone back into politics after that. Okay, uh, we have six minutes left of the show. Uh, now, both the Conservatives and Labour have had questions from the media about access to leaders and the way they campaign and uh, events are covered. Now, Jeremy Corbyn has been happy to chat to voters in front of the cameras, but Labour temporarily restricted BuzzFeed's access to campaign events because it had disrupted media coverage of Labour's launch event. The website's political editor, Jim Waterson, interviewed Mr Corbyn. The headline was, Jeremy Corbyn says he won't quit even if he loses the general election. Labour said this wasn't accurate, but a recording suggests it is. Now, here's a typical Corbyn moment from a rally in York yesterday on a platform in front of a crowd, microphone in hand. There's an awful lot more I'd like to say, but there's somebody pulling at my trouser leg at the moment. <laughs> and they're doing it for a very good reason, because apparently I'm supposed to be speaking in Rotherham in the near future. <laughs> wow. So the publicists were doing their job, unless it was Tim Farron's Spaniel doing that. <laughs> Um, what do we think of what do we think of uh, Corbyn as uh, an oratory genius? Uh, Gronier, I'll start with you. Oh, oh, oh well, God. that's rousing. <laughs> he'll, be, he'll be over the moon that the Labour supporting Gronier Maguire <laughs> gave such a. Such... The thing is, the thing is. If you like Jeremy Corbyn, you think he's a brilliant speaker, but he's not. He's very much sort of like a band who does a lot of album. You know, album tracks rather yeah. than crossover hits. Yeah, and I think he he should have a few more 
crossover hits rather than this is an acoustic cover of that B-side from the yeah. album I released 10 years ago. Uh, very quickly, Miranda, controlling yeah. access. Mm. You know. Well, yeah, so, 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 you know, Sarah, you're in real. I mean, that was the, I think, the, the venue for that, for that famous John Prescott punch. Was indeed, the protester. egg in the face the th- followed by the right hook. Indeed. Which the, we tried the, to recreate for Instagram, but it didn't quite work. The thriller in Rilla. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, and there was the famous <laughs> confrontation between, uh, you know, Gillian, Mrs. Gillian Duffy and Gordon Brown on the subject of immigration in, in that election that he went on to lose. So it's a big risk because, you know, if a member of the public turns out to be more eloquent and sums up the mood of the nation better than the party leader who's on tour, that's a pretty big setback for your campaign. But I think this time round, more than ever, it's all looking so controlled and so dull. And wow. it also it looks as if the party leaders are scared of the general public and just bussing in a load of your own supporters well, I think is extremely un, un, unimpressive, really. Well, with Corbyn's oratory skills, also sometimes he's got that look of, you know, when you're at a service station, there's that bloke that looks like he's worried he got separated from his coach party. Yes. <laughs> Every once in a while, that look passes across his face. <laughs> <laughs> but however, in his defence, I, I, I'm not sure I'd want BuzzFeed there because you know that they'd be it and you think, I hope they kind of like report on the policies, but then they'll be like Ter- Jeremy Corbyn's 11 best haircuts from the 70s. So mm-hmm. they're not necessarily always the most on point political you source. You snob, Jeff. <laughs> well, it's snob. really interesting though what Miranda was saying there because on the Conservative trail, you've had some journalists this week claiming that um, questions from them need to be cleared in advance with Theresa May's aides. And also that while the PM wants to hear from the people who've been invited to attend her constituency, as he visits, it all feels a little bit sanitised, as you said, very tightly controlled. Yeah, really Here robotic, is. actually, sometimes. Yeah, well, let's have a listen. Here she is in Leeds. Got a question back, and then... Sorry, is that... You've got a pen in your hand. Are you a journalist? I'm going to take the workforce first, please, if I may, and then I'll take some media questions. Yes. OK, we need any excuse just to play this again. Uh, it's our favourite election moment so far. Uh, from Tim Farron in Cambridge. Can you smell my, smell my spaniel, maybe? maybe. All right, how are you? Good to see you. Now, sadly, he wasn't inviting a voter to smell his dog, uh, Jasper, but offering... Oh, if only the dog had been called Fenton, it'd been even better. But uh, offering uh, for people who know that video of Fenton, uh, they will find that funny. Jeff, clearly you do. But offering a possible explanation as to why the dog of the person he was talking to was so excitable. <laughs> wow, how difficult is it to control the message? Gronia. But I just, I hate, like, you know that clip of that uh, guy attacking Tim Farron, just being really rude and abusive yes. to him? Mm. The thing is... Was he that rude? I thought he was horrible. I think that members of the general public are usually awful human beings. <laughs> I'm a stand-up comedian, Jeff will back me up. Human beings are awful. <laughs> uh, Gronia's <laughs> tour dates uh, will be available on our website. Uh, That's horrible. a new show title, Human <laughs> Beings on, Are Gronia. Awful. <laughs> Get it off your chest. They're They're the left insulting the voters again. Brilliant. <laughs> they are horrible. You, most voters She's do not know what they're talking time. about. <laughs> And the MPs go around, they're just doing their job, and people are horrible to them. So I have I... to show comedian unity here. You give the public a voice when they weren't expecting it, weird stuff comes out. It has to be said. <laughs> exactly. Still, I, I, like, yeah, good. I, I, they, I, I fully understand why they want to avoid them. I'd avoid human, <laughs> the general members of the public if I could. Right, OK, well, that, I mean, I can't see how uh, a Westminster bubble can happen if that's the attitude. I think it's, it, it's the people that tend to, to, like, approach out of nowhere and you could see that guy's adrenaline was up and his blood yeah. was up and it's like question time where that one person just goes, what are you going to do about my paddling pool? You think, not really a reasonable question, <laughs> is it? <laughs> you know, so they have some sympathy. Uh, well, listen, thank you very much uh, to all of you for being on. That's our first uh, afternoon edition political party. Uh, Gronya Maguire who's a stand-up of course and loves human beings uh, Miranda Green <laughs> from the uh, Lib Dems and Jeff Norcott uh, knowingly the only Tory uh, comedian that we know of. On digital and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live